work. And um, I would really like to introduce uh, Dr. Brianna Osborne from uh, the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, where she is doing uh, research uh, in aging. Uh, and she's going to be talking about loss of uh, CD38 uh, today and uh, uh, how it exacerbates premature aging in the Cochrane syndrome. Uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Brianna Osborne is also a global trotter. Uh, I think she comes from Australia natively, uh, where she did her uh, uh, graduate work. Um, and uh, yeah, wonderful representation of uh, the University of Copenhagen. Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, please go ahead, Brianna. Brianna. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Great. Just wait for the slides to come up. Okay, there they are. Uh, okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the uh, invitation to present some of our work today. Um, to the organizers, uh, especially Morton, who is my boss, so he deserves a special thank you, I guess. Um, so we all know that aging is a highly complex process, um, and it displays in a variety of different phenotypes depending on genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors. Um, and Morton showed this slide uh, yesterday, uh, so I'll go through it fairly quickly, but we know that uh, there's lots of different phenotypes associated with aging. Um, some of them are highly prevalent and also highly visible, such as graying of hair, uh, facial wrinkles. Um, however, uh, other phenotypes uh, that are highly prevalent but maybe uh, less visible, phenotypes such as cancer, neurodegeneration, um, and specifically metabolic disease. Uh, so to cut through this complexity um, in the aging phenotype, we use uh, premature aging models uh, to help us study uh, the aging process. Uh, and so uh, there's been a really good introduction uh, at previous talks in this meeting uh, and the previous talk um, on some of these premature aging disorders. But so we know that um, uh, genomic instability is one of the hallmarks of aging. And so many of these um, premature aging disorders are in genes and proteins involved in maintaining the genome. So in our lab, we use uh, a model of cocaine syndrome uh, so cocaine syndrome uh, is childhood onset genetic disease. Um, it's very devastating uh, for the children and their families. The mean lifespan is 12 years. Uh, and the main clinical features are neurodegeneration, um, sensitivity to UV, and growth defects. These include uh, uh, dwarfism, changes in facial structure, and changes in uh, fat deposition. And so cocaine syndrome in the main is caused uh, by the loss of either the CSA or CSB protein. Um, and these proteins are involved in uh, transcription coupled nucleotide excision repair. So in our lab, we use cell models, uh, fly models, and mouse models of cocaine syndrome, uh, primarily focusing on the CSB uh, protein. Uh, so this has been explained in the previous talk, but for those that weren't listening, I'll go through it quickly. So, uh, when there's DNA damage, um, we get an uh, activation of the PARP1 protein. And PARP1 uh, is an enzyme that consumes NAD to produce chains of polyADP ribose. Um, and these um, PAR uh, polymers uh, signal uh, to other transcription uh, repair machinery. Um, so it's thought that CSB uh, helps displace PARP1 from the DNA after it's done this uh, signaling process um, to allow other uh, parts of the uh, transcription repair process to occur. So in cocaine syndrome, when CSB is uh, not there, or uh, in uh, advanced aging, when there's an accumulation of DNA damage, uh, we get a hyperactivation of PARP1. And it's thought that this uh, drives a depletion of the NAD pool uh, in the cell. And so I don't really need to go into um, uh, the huge amount of research looking at NAD decline, uh, but it's involved in, in many different pathologies. Um, and we're quite interested in this um, metabolic pathology associated with NAD decline. And so to just come full circle, many of these pathologies seen in um, NAD deficient states are also seen in cocaine syndrome, um, such as premature hearing loss, neurodegeneration, um, and also uh, glucose control issues such as diabetes. 
So there is a mouse model of CSB depletion, um, and it does show a milder phenotype than in human patients. Um, however, Morton in his previous work showed that when CSB is knocked down in mice, that you uh, get whole body metabolic defects um, associated with dysfunctional mitochondria. Um, and so uh, we're quite interested in this metabolic dysfunction. Um, and Morton also previously showed that by boosting NAD levels um, or increasing ketones or altering cellular bioenergetics by feeding a high-fat diet uh, could alleviate some of these effects. Um, so again, this has been covered in this meeting, but um, we don't really uh, have a good handle on why NAD decreases with age, although there's lots of theories. So the main um, proteins that consume NAD um, are the sirtuins, uh, which are central regulators of metabolism, circadian rhythm, amongst many other functions. Um, the PARPs, which I've already talked about, PARP1, involved in DNA repair. Um, and then this other family of ADP ribosal cyclases, of which CD38 is a member. Um, and so uh, this was also discussed by Eric Verdon uh, in yesterday's uh, talks. Um, but in uh, 2016, uh, Eduardo Cini's lab showed a very strong correlation between CD38 levels that increase with age um, and NAD levels um, decreasing. And when you knock out CD38, uh, you uh, can reduce this decline in NAD that occurs with age. Um, and this is associated with improvements in mitochondrial function. So we were interested in whether CD38 um, inhibition would work in cocaine syndrome. And so um, the idea is that uh, when you knock out CD38, you could boost uh, cellular NAD levels, and this could alleviate some of the phenotypes that we see in cocaine syndrome, but also in uh, aging pathologies. And so to investigate this, we generated a double knockout mouse model. So we crossed the CSB uh, knockout mouse with the CD38 knockout to generate this double knockout. And so uh, I'm just going to show a small part of our in vivo phenotyping study today. Um, but uh, everything will have four groups. So we have the wild type mice, which should show uh, standard age dependent NAD decline. Uh, the CSB knockout mice, which should show uh, accelerated aging uh, with decreased NAD. Uh, the CD38 knockout mice, um, and then the double knockout mice. So our hypothesis was that perhaps uh, uh, having the deletion of CD38, we could see a rescue of the NAD levels. Uh, and we followed these mice over one year, um, and we did phenotyping at uh, 18 weeks and at 52 weeks, uh, more or less. Um, I'll mainly talk about the one-year study. Um, so while I call this group my old cohort, they're not really old in terms of uh, aging studies on mice, but we chose this 12-month time point because um, it's a time point at which we can see um, the CSB decline, um, whereas the wild-type mice should be fairly healthy at this at this age point. So the first thing we look at is body weight. And so in red here, you can see the CSB mice. And then the CD38 in blue and the wild type in gray tend to um, have a fairly normal body weight trajectory over time. Um, the CSB has been published earlier and has uh, this reduced body weight. But we were quite interested to see that the double knockouts had uh, even uh, decreased body weight. So we see this um, at 20 weeks, um, and then we also see this at 52 weeks. Um, and then down here we have body length, so these mice are also shorter in stature. Uh, so we also looked at fat mass and body composition in these mice. Um, so this is fat mass and lean mass uh, measured by echo MRI. Um, and we actually see that all our groups are lighter than wild types. Um, but the double knockout uh, has the lowest fat mass and the lowest lean mass of any of our groups. Um, when we excise the fat pads, we can measure the size of them as well. And again, the CSB has reduced. Uh, this is the visceral fat tissue. Um, so does the CD38, but the double knockout is the uh, smallest uh, fat pads. We see this also with subcutaneous um, fat. So to investigate this phenotype, we uh, uh, did uh, indirect calorimetry. So this is a technique where we can measure uh, mice inside a sealed chamber, and we can uh, see the, their consumption of oxygen uh, and CO2, and we can look at their food intake and activity. And so um, 
what we saw when we looked at RER, so the respiratory exchange ratio is a measure, um, it's the CO2 over the O2, and it tells us a little bit about what kind of fuel um, these mice are consuming. So when the RER is lower, they're um, burning fat primarily, um, and when the RER is higher, um, they're burning carbohydrate. And so what we saw, especially in the light phase, so when the mice are supposed to be sleeping, um, that they are uh, burning much more fat, both the CSB group here in red and the double knockout group in purple. And again, uh, we see this um, exacerbation of this phenotype with the double knockout. Uh, so in this cohort, we didn't see, or at this age at least, we didn't see any large changes in uh, oxygen consumption or in energy expenditure. Um, however, when we looked at activity, and um, we did see some um, quite variable in activity, but we did see some changes. So um, both the CSB and the double knockout mice were significantly more active than the CD38 mice. And um, this is quite interesting. Um, when we looked at food intake, we saw that the double knockout mice actually ate more um, chow per day per kilo even though they are uh, much smaller. And so we think this increase in activity could have something to do with food-seeking behavior, but we haven't done the, the specific experiments to look at that. And because we're interested in metabolism, we also had a look at glucose tolerance. So this is an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, we see quite a similar pattern when the mice are young. Um, but this is the one um, measure that we did where the uh, double knockout and the CD38 knockout um, kind of have a more similar feature, and the CSB is quite different. So in grey, we have the wild-type mice and their um, a response to our oral glucose bolus, uh, bolus. So they're still quite um, glucose-sensitive, and their glucose comes down with time. Um, the CSB, very similar to the wild-type. However, both the CD38 and the double knockout um, have a much smaller glucose excursion. Uh, we can see that here in the area under the curve. Um, however, when we looked at insulin release in these mice, um, this uh, control of glucose doesn't seem to be due to increased insulin. So actually, the double knockouts have the lowest insulin of any of the groups. So um, a group yesterday, uh, there was a talk also on this um, frailty scoring. I'll just go through this very quickly, but at 12 months, we don't see a big difference in the, the general frailty index. The mice are actually quite healthy. But if you look at... Um, uh, something like kyphosis, for, in for instance, which is the um, curvature of the spine that occurs with age, we're much more likely to see this occurring in the mice um, from the CSB group and the double knockout group um, than we are in the other two groups. So the summary of the in vivo phenotype is that, um, as has been reported before, the CSB mice have this aberrant metabolic phenotype, um, mainly due to reduced fat mass and altered respiration. However, and this goes against our initial hypothesis, um, CD38 deficiency did not alleviate this phenotype, and in most cases it exacerbated it. And so we've also done a little bit of cell work in this area. Um, the cell work is still quite preliminary, but um, we have uh, MEF cells that we generated from these mouse lines. And because UV sensitivity is one of the, the hallmarks of cocaine syndrome, we can actually treat these cells in the dish with UV. And uh, where's my... Winter, here it is. Um, so in grey, you can see the wild type um, cells. Uh, they obviously are affected by the UV, but the CSB cells in red are much more sensitive to the UV damage. And in purple, we see uh, the double knockout cells are actually more sensitive, um, at least at some of these time points. This was work done by Melder, a master student in the lab. He also had a look at mitochondrial content and oxidative uh, stress. So this is um, superoxide production. And interestingly, in the CSB, there, there could be a, a hint that uh, mitochondrial content is upregulated to compensate for these changes. Uh, we don't see that in the double knockout. And uh, we see an increase in superoxide production uh, in the double knockout specifically. Uh, we also have like a human cell model uh, looking at a brain-like cell type. So this is SHSY5Y cells. Um, and we use CRISPR to generate a deletion um, in CSB, in exon 2, in these cells. Um, and again, uh, we see an increase in this UV sensitivity phenotype. And here we used an inhibitor of CD38, uh, 78C, uh, to treat the cells. Um, and we saw a similar thing to what we saw in the mice. So no 
uh, improvement, but uh, possibly a slight um, exacerbation of the UV sensitivity. So in summary, both in vivo and in vitro, uh, CD38 deletion appears to exacerbate the phenotypes of cocaine syndrome, um, including UV sensitivity, uh, changes in fat metabolism and oxidative stress. And so um, what does this tell us? We're still really at the beginning of this study, um, but it does raise questions about crosstalk between these major enzymes and how this could impact on aging. And uh, also raises uh, some questions about CD38 inhibition um, and whether it's a viable treatment for some types of aging. Um, and so hopefully we'll have more on this story um, next time. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone in the lab that's helped with this and our collaborators and our funders. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, an amazing talk. Uh, thank you, Brianna. Uh, Brianna uh, and uh, uh, lots of questions. Uh, it would be great if uh, you could also later go to uh, uh, Slack and uh, help answer them. Yep. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll try it for the sake of time to uh, ask three. So a uh, question from uh, Professor Vera Garbunova. Uh, great to see her online. Uh, are CD38 knockout mice uh, have longer lifespan? And do they move less despite more NID? Um, am I? Yep. So I, um, I think the, the main papers on CD38 from the Chini lab, um, they've looked at the CD38 mice at a much later time point. So we're looking at, at 12 months. Um, so I can't comment too much on, on lifespan, but definitely they've reported an increased health span. Um, and, uh, yeah, in, as far as the, the moving less, I don't think anyone else has reported that before. Um, and we didn't see this effect when they were young from memory. So um, I think we'll have to look into that a bit more. All right, so question from uh, Wilbert uh, Vermish. Uh, is uh, CD38 uh, affected by interventions like dietary restriction or di uh, the army medics? Okay, so... Um, I'm actually not sure if I can answer that question appropriately on how CD38 is affected. Um, I think I'd have to go back and have a look at the data on that one. So, No problem. Let's go for just one more question. Yeah. So Jan Hojmakis, uh, the lower body weight and loss of uh, subcutaneous fat caused the uh, CSB and double knockout mice uh, to um, lose more heat. Uh, to which extent uh, in this, uh, is this causing higher fuel usage? Um, yeah, so that's, that's possible. We haven't looked too much at that. We, um, we group house our mice, um, so I'm hoping that some of, some of that should be controlled for. Obviously, if they were singly housed, we would have, um, have to really keep that in mind. Um, we don't have the facilities to be doing um, surface temperature checks in our uh, setup at the moment, so that's something we could we could look at as well. But definitely, when you're looking at this indirect calorimetry, you've got to take every every little parameter into account. So um, yeah, this is uh, definitely um, something that we'll be looking at in more detail now that we have these interesting results. Great, thank you very much for this talk. And like the uh, many uh, others from Morton's lab, I uh, would love to see you running your own group sometime very soon. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. Um, yeah. Uh